All right, we are live. Greetings, Mike Pappas. Uh, is, is, I guess it's Dr. Michael Pappas now, right, huh? Yeah, I tell, I don't even introduce myself as doctor. Right. It's normally just like, hey, I'm Mike, what what the hell's up? And then people are well, like, who the hell are you? And then I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm the doctor. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're a humble guy, but it is a, it's a big deal, you know? And I have a lot of medical stuff on here for us to talk about later. But first of all, greetings. Welcome to the podcast. Happy Thanks. Dances, Guide to the Revolution. Uh, really yeah. appreciate your time and coming on the show and talking with me. And uh, I'm super excited to kind of get into some things here. So, cool. Same appreciate here. you. Um, so, we're going to talk about where we know each other. But before we get into that, the first question I like to open with is like, what do you think of the movement here that I'm trying, that I'm aiming for? Uh, questions, comments, like general feelings on it. Um, thoughts, whatever you want to. I mean, anything, in my opinion, anything that contributes towards the movement for a revolution is, is a positive contribution because I think that that's where we need to go. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I think that we're at a stage and I'm sure we can get into this a little bit more, but I think that the world is at a stage right now where I don't think anything less than revolution is going to suffice. I think that we can reforms are great and and obviously we want to continue to work towards reforms. I work towards various reforms in my everyday practice, but I think ultimately we need to overthrow many of the deep oppressive structures that are built into our society otherwise we're going to continue seeing um, the suffering and death that we're currently seeing both in the United States and all over the globe. So I think it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the reasons, uh, well, I guess the main reason that I have the three as the E in revolution is because I don't think any of this is worth it if we don't do it with love, man. Mm hmm. If we if we tear everything down and rebuild it with something that's just as oppressive, just as just as dangerous, just as cruel, just as corrupt, then we wasted our time anyway. So yeah, no, I uh, I completely agree. Through various exper like experiences I've had in my life, um, it, like I've learned that love is at the center of everything, or is at the center of everything, and should be at the center of everything that we're working towards. Mm -hmm. So I'm in complete agreement. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about how we know each other a little bit. So, yes. <laughs> go ahead, Pennsylvania Gov School. Go ahead. Wait. So, okay. First off, I don't know if 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 you feel the same way I do. I've been thinking a lot about Pennsylvania Governor School. Okay. So, for anybody who doesn't know, Pennsylvania Governor School is a program. It's a it's a it's a number of programs in Pennsylvania funded by. Um, I guess the state government, the governor's office, um, for students who want to pursue specific, I guess, like specific fields. And we were both in the Pennsylvania Governor's School for Global Entrepreneurship, it was called. It was held at Lehigh University. Uh, you were there for like a month. We were there for a month, right? Five, five weeks. Five weeks. Okay. So we were there for five weeks and they basically like, have you up in the dorms there as high school students, and then you are paired with a business to work with, and you go through all of these lectures and those types of things. And I've been thinking a lot about the leading up to this, the governor's school, and I almost think that, in my opinion, we could call the Pennsylvania governor's school really like the Pennsylvania governor's school for conditioning in business exploitation. I think that I, and at the time, so, so here's, I will speak from my perspective of being at the governor's school. So when I was at the governor's school, I did not identify politically as I currently do. We'll just say right off of the front, I currently identify as a revolutionary Marxist. Um, that, that's probably like my uh, political affiliation or whatever you want to call it. At that time, I actually had the mindset of wanting to be a corporate lawyer. Um, I, that's why I wanted to go to the, I thought, well, if I want to be a corporate lawyer, if I go to the Pennsylvania Governor's School, maybe that'll help me somehow like rise these ranks of, of business. And that's what I was conditioned my entire life to believe that I should be doing up to that point. So I thought that that would be best for that. 
And I think that when we were there, like you and I got, I think got along pretty well, right? But one of the things I distinctly remember was I remember <laughs> Jordan like at points standing on desks and like yelling to people like completely opposing what they were saying. And I think now that I've been reflecting on it more, like you were spot on with what you were doing. And I remember thinking to myself, like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Like, why is he yelling at these people? I don't get it. And I think part of it was like, I didn't understand. Like we had people, executives from AT&T coming to speak and all these people talking about things that they've done in countries all over the world. And really what they were talking about is how they were exploiting and destroying other areas of the world and talking to high school students about that and how they should also start doing that. And I thought like at that time, oh, well, this is pretty cool. These guys are like the heads of their field. This is great. But really now reflecting on it where I am in my life, it's like pretty scary to think that we are taking high school students and conditioning them from that young age to just be funneled into these arms of corporate power mm. uh, to then destroy the globe pretty much. Right. That's an interesting take on that. Like, uh, I, I definitely see what you're saying. I'm not sure I feel exactly the same way, but I, I definitely I get what you mean, you know? Um, and just to kind of give some context of where I was at the time, uh, I was super interested in renewable energy. I knew that's, I, I was pretty sure that I wanted to pursue a career related to that. I knew that climate change was probably one of the biggest things that we were going to have to face in our generation. And the specific instance that you're talking about where I got up on the table was after the, uh, uh, it was basically Al Gore's presentation given by somebody else who was like Al Gore's like employee or whatever, you know, and it was the inconvenient truth presentation in like slide slideshow format. And he gave that. And what I said, I, I don't know exactly what I said, but what, but what I was trying to say when I got up on the table was like, we should start like a wind company, like right now we should bring like all our money together. There's incentives on the table. Like this is, this industry is going to be booming. And like, I didn't really know what I was doing then. Like I still don't really fully know what I'm doing, but I was right. I mean, there were huge incentives that came right after 2008 and had we put together, you know, several million dollars and started a wind company or some sort of, we probably would be sitting pretty pretty right now, you know? Yeah, yeah, I think you were pretty right. I, I, I also don't, so you remember that event a little bit more clearly than I do. And uh, one of the questions I had is, did you get down from that desk out of your free will or did somebody pull you down or do you remember what exactly transpired in that which I <laughs> yeah i got scolded i remember getting scolded a little bit and then steven th they even like threatened to like they didn't say they were going to kick me out but they were like they basically said that they talked about like maybe punishing me and like and i was like dude whatever man like yeah you got to take action and not be too afraid of consequences i mean so what i stood up on the table and said yeah, something. exactly like yeah i was 17 and like passionate about the planet and saw a business opportunity and wanted to kind of put a team together. And that's kind of where, to bring it full circle, that's where I'm at again today with this whole effort is like trying to put a team together. Like there's something important that I think we have to do. Mm -hmm. I'm, I can kind of imagine what a team might look like to work on these things. Mm -hmm. And instead of standing on a table, I'm putting this podcast together and yeah. my Facebook friends and pretty much anybody who will listen, you know? There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but so I guess that's where uh, we first met each other there. Um, I actually ended up doing, being like a mentor or something for that program the next year. And okay. I, don't, I don't really even know why I did that. I think it was more just like I need something to do over the summer. Or maybe it was two years after that when I was in college. I needed something to do over the summer. So I went back to that program and worked there for a summer and then haven't really been in touch with them um with them since but yeah it was uh i guess it was an interesting experience to say the least and some of the people who we went to that program with i know or at least one of them i know is a physician right now 
Um, I actually, when I was interviewing for residency programs, <laughs> she she was there um, at another program in New York. Uh, Sheeran. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and just to kind of give a little bit more context for people, it was like 70 people, maybe a little bit more, and like most of them were from Pennsylvania, and then there was another maybe 10 or 15 that were from different places from around the world. Palestine. Palestine, yeah. Is Yazid? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, still, I still speak with him every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah, which actually that's another, I mean, I don't know if that's the direction we want to go, but that's a, but like, I mean, thinking even about uh, that at that time, I didn't know anything about the occupied territories or anything like that. And I remember Yazid would tell us these stories. So Yazid, I don't know where exactly he was from. Uh, Might have been Gaza. I can't, or the West Bank. I can't exactly remember, but he would tell stories of like, how um, the Israeli forces would be like there in full uniform and he would just like, they would be trying to like push him and his family around and he would be like either throwing rocks at them or kick them and those types of things. And I remember at that time, like I thought like, oh, this is co like kind of comical. Like, who is this guy? What's going on? And now more and more hearing about that conflict, it's like, like, holy shit, that he was experiencing real, like real oppression there, and and yeah. has been. I mean, I think he's he's not there currently, but um, it's just interesting to reflect back on it now with the historical perspective that I have years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was a big deal too because for me, I mean, I grew up in a pretty small town in Pennsylvania. Like, I never met anybody from any of those places really before that, you know. And to have that opportunity to connect with them and hear their story and gain that perspective for me was, was helpful, you know, yeah. maybe not in like any direct way, but maybe just left me more prepared and more experience and, you know, more comfortable working in teams and more comfortable with the kind of the college setting that they kind of had us in. Mm -hmm. So I look at it as a pretty positive, positive experience. And you mentioned Sheeran and, and what she's doing, you know, and, I, I've fallen out of touch with pretty much everybody. I mean, Stefan, I know Stefan a little bit from school. He and I even lived together for a year. Um, mm -hmm. But, like, I haven't even talked to him. Like, And I would bet that, I don't know, let's just pick a number, like 90% of the people that went there are either, like, successful or, like, very successful, you know? And now, whether success means, you know, how do you define success, right? That's kind of another yeah. question, right? Um, yeah. But I guess maybe how I would loosely define it is that they've they've done – something substantial you know yeah hopefully whatever goals they set for themselves they hit that's kind of how i would loosely define it. and that's exciting man i can't say that about you know 90 percent of any other population of people that i know you know and that's cool yeah no that's true so what else do you remember from from that anything else jumps out either specific memory about about me or specific memory about the event or like anything that jumps out to you that was like um <laughs> The only other thing that specifically jumps out to me about that event, and I don't really know how much to take from this, was I remember uh, at night we were supposed to stay in our, like, dorm rooms, and that yeah. was a really strict uh, yeah. <laughs> rule. And I, and I remember the one morning Yazid was nowhere to be found, and he climbed out of his window that that night i don't know if you remember this but i think he wanted to just like watch the sunset or watch the sunrise and they went to find him in the morning and he wasn't there and everybody freaked out because he climbed out of his window and just was like walking up the hill like watching the sunrise and then he came back and everybody was like where were you and he's, he was just like i was watching the sunrise like everybody cool down and yeah. everybody was <laughs> Everybody was freaking out, and Yazid was just like, "It's no, it's just cool. Like I just yep. left for a second. Yep. I'm back. You, there's no need to make this into a big deal. I just wanted to watch the sunrise." And I also just think about you know you mentioning interacting with people from different areas of the world and those types of things. I also just like reflecting on that kind of off the cuff. Also think about the conditioning that we in the U.S. receive 
like throughout our lives, I think, I think that that happens. I think it starts in like kindergarten or preschool or those types of things, conditioning to like obey authority on many levels to fall into like the edu- the educational system I think is largely built to con- in the United States to condition people that way. And I think many of us to get into that program had to have like decent grades, certain think certain like I don't know what we had to do to get into that, write essays or do whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we had to like do a lot of the things that that mainstream educational system wants you to do. Um, and I think that that was something seeing somebody like climb out of a window and just directly disobey a rule like that wasn't something that many of us even it was even on our radar a lot of the time to even do. And I think that that speaks to some of the conditioning that we go through even at a young age in this country, just that example. Yeah. And, or the, you know, the example of me getting up on the table, like obviously nobody told me to do that. Nobody, you know, they were actually pretty unhappy probably that I did that and drew so much attention to myself and, you know, maybe looked like a buffoon, but was it worth it though? You know? And I don't know if you're into like personality tests and stuff, uh, whether it's like Myers Briggs or like the Hogwarts houses or whatever. Like I'm into all that stuff. I think it's pretty interesting. But one of them I took was um, through Imperative.com, and it was pretty comprehensive. And like the the type that I ended up being kind of classified as was the the disruptor, <laughs> which I was like, yeah, that's pretty much nails it, you know. And that's that's kind of how I see myself sometimes. And that's kind of what I was doing there is like. I'm not afraid to make noise and make a little bit of a mess, you know, especially if it's for the right reason, you know? Yeah. And it can be dangerous and it can be counterproductive too. Like when I was, uh, in my most recent, recent job, I kind of communicated this to my boss and I was like, think, think of me in that way. Like Mm -hmm. you can almost think of me as like a little firecracker. If you squeeze me in your hand and try to like control everything that I'm doing, then you're just going to blow your fingers off and it's not going to be any fun for anybody. But if like you can figure out a way to channel me in the proper direction, then we can do great things. You know, we can make great changes. We can have impact, you know. Okay, we're back. A little disconnection there. Um, okay, so I was kind of talking about Gov School. But one of the things I think you and I had in common, and one of the things, one of the reasons I think you and I got along pretty well while we were there, is because we're both sort of outspoken in our own way. Mm-hmm. You know, like, if we disagree, you're going to know. Yeah, no, I agree. I think... Um... You were just mentioning the what you've said to your boss. And I mean, I think that, <clears throat> I don't know, I, I, okay, so when it comes to the personality trait tests and those types of things, mm-hmm. to a certain degree, I think that, that whether for better or for worse, like, I think that there's a lot of data, especially on like Myers-Briggs, how it, it was used from its onset uh, for corporations basically to further exploit people to find out what silos to put them in if they could and to justify treating them particular ways in the workplace that may not be justified. So mm-hmm. to reduce things to people's like personality trait and then say like, oh, well, that's why I'm going to put you here really because it just benefits the bottom line or or those types of things. So from that front, uh, that's, I guess, why, and from the front of, I don't know if you've been following anything with the recent leaks from like the Cambridge Analytical, Analytica scandal and the personality test that they use for the Cambridge Analytical, Analytica scandal, but like um, the way that that was has been used to control populations, I'm not crazy about, but I do think that inherently, people have certain things about them, like they're that inherent personality type. Uh, and I would definitely agree with that. I mean, I've been, I, my parents say it's like that from a young age, even I remember when I was in elementary school, I had to do some type of presentation for, for in front of the school board on like a planet that we made with our parents. And my parents still say to this day, I was in front of the school board, in front of the head of the school board, just like talking shit to him and talking back to him because he, I was like six, I was in first grade or second yeah. grade, however old you are there. And, and he just tried to like give me a little bit of a nudge and I just like went in on him. And I think I, I, I mean, I think that though, 
especially to the way that we organize, especially we organize workplaces now that can be somewhat disruptive, but I also think that that's definitely needed. Um, there's different, I read a couple different books and, and studies on different types of activists and, and, uh, and how many different, I guess the, what they're really reducing it to, I think is personality types or how you function in society, basically contribute to the revolution. And I think that you need people who are willing to shake things up uh, like the re I think they call it in the one book I read the rebel you need people who are willing to rebel around those things I mean right now at the institution where I work we're in contract negotiations and union contract negotiations and we have uh, it's a group of what I think 20 or so resident physicians all in contract negotiations together and I was mentioning before how our educational system conditions people I think you to get into medicine you go through some of I think almost more than any other profession more conditioning mechanisms you need to not only get through high school but then get into a decent college then do well in college take all the board exams have the money to even purchase the board exams, then get into medical school, afford medical school, which puts you in a certain class. That's a filtering mechanism in itself. Then you have to take other board exams to get in. I mean, it's like filter, 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 filter until you finally get to the end point, which is you have your degree. But by that point, I think, especially for the United States where healthcare is such a business, you want to make sure that you have conditioned the people who you allow to be in the position of a physician to really, really not question authority. So mm -hmm. we're in these uh, contract negotiations and I think that the, I, what I've seen is varying degrees of uh, willingness to rebel among colleagues and obviously that changes with responses of the employer and how angry people get and those types of things and organizing, but you definitely see like there are certain individuals who are just more willing to rebel straight up. There are other individuals that are a little bit more concerned about uh, kind of meeting our employer where they are. And I think everybody's needed to a certain degree for certain things. Like if everybody just wanted to, especially in this, just rebel and just go right to strike, that could also be problematic for various reasons. Um, I'm of the thought process that I think we need more rebellion personally, but I do think that everybody has their place in that, in whatever the movement, no matter how big or how small around that. Mm -hmm. And related to kind of those personality aspects and how willing people are to rebel, I think it comes down to how disagreeable or agreeable people are like naturally, you know, cause like anybody can be disagreeable right but how easy does it come to you how is it like your first thing you're trying to do or or are you non-confrontational and trying to just kind of like go with the flow you know and i think that is a part of people's personalities to some extent you know and obviously the issue it depends on what the issue is and how much it relates to them and how willing they are to be disagreeable but i think that's the part of it is how easy does it come to you you know because anybody can be anything right but like what come, like what's natural? What's what's your strength sort of, you know, and I think you point out too that like things like Myers-Briggs have been used to negative ends or, you, you know, the results have been not manipulated, but sort of um, like you said, used to put people in certain boxes and then leave them there, or whatever, you know, and that's I think that brings up a kind of a broader point of duality and cumulative truth. And that's something that I'm always trying to point back to you with these complex issues is that like whether it's like the economy and you know um, kind of using abusing and abusing labor to unjust ends you know but that's also like jobs for people right so it's like both things are true right so like how do we balance that things the fact that both things are true like light is is a is a particle and a wave right it's both things. It seems like they would be opposites, but they're both true at the same time. And in order to fully understand light, you have to understand the duality of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's something I'm always trying to kind of keep in mind and keep balanced. And it doesn't mean that like 
one thing or the other is true. It's the opposite. They're both true. So how mm-hmm. do we how do we reconcile both of them? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> when it comes to discussions about the economy, I definitely think like there's there are certain aspects of employment or like having a job that also give if it's a job that is rewarding help to give people self-worth bring them joy those types of things Mm -hmm. while there's also i would say in the capitalist um way of organizing the economy the exploitative aspect of that so how can you find truth in both of those things um i think more and more i've been looking for different ways to that workplaces can be organized to both organize a a a a workplace to allow for people to have that meaning and enjoy in their life and connection that they get through do it accomplishing a task mm-hmm. as a human being but mm-hmm. also not have their bodies exploited for profit the way more and more i've been moving towards and been like advocating for whether it's in the clinic setting uh mm-hmm. through our union bargaining i've been pushing for this actually at our larger clinic trying to get some of the higher ups to kind of think about pushing for this, but is w- working more towards wor- a worker cooperative yep. uh, organizational structure. Yep. And I think that I, I think that ultimately that not only <laughs> will kind of bring more um, joy and meaning and control over somebody's life, but I, based on those things, I think it also could help have positive health outcomes or would have positive health outcomes. And as a physician, we more and more, I think in the American medical system, the way that the American, I think in in order to answer that question about the workplace and those types of things, you need to understand the American medical system. And I think the American medical system is organized to basically extract profit from sick bodies, if I want to summarize how I view the American medical system. Um, It's these institutions that make up the medical industrial complex, whether it's the large hospital corporations, pharmaceutical companies, device uh, device manufacturers, they're all for-profit companies run by a small um, board of directors um, and top shareholders that their top goal is to continue to produce profit. Um, and when you have an, that dynamic inside of a system that is supposed to care about health and well being, they just do not go together. And then we see the results that we see inside of the current healthcare system. But if we started to organize, uh, the both, institutions inside of our healthcare system and institutions inside of our larger society in a different way, Mm -hmm. I think we would see a more humane healthcare system. And then we would also see um, a society built that actually gives people meaning, worth, and doesn't make them feel alienated in their workplace, which then leads to all different types of health issues, which I think we could get into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I did want to cue you up for that because, you know, as Kind of a peer of mine, but one that's taken a different path and found himself, you know, found himself in the medical field. Uh, I'd love to kind of get your opinion on how we might kind of restructure some of these things, or kind of getting a look at it from the inside, like what needs to be changed, and like, and how that maybe relates to your self-identification as a revolutionary Marxist. Like, what do we need to do? What do we? How do we change this to be better for? You know, how do we change it? What do we? What do you think needs to get done? Yeah, I mean, I think just on the reform level, one of the one of the best reforms that I think we can work towards that can start to change it is moving towards a, a Medicare for all system in the United States. I think we're one of the we are like the only developed country that doesn't have health care as a human right, even after the Affordable Care Act was passed, which I think the Affordable Care Act largely was was pretty bad overall, actually, um, contrary to m- what many people in more 
um, liberal democratic camps would argue. I think that the Affordable Care Act just gave subsidies to private companies and forced people to get uh, in health insurance from private companies who, if I'm being blunt, don't give a shit about them and don't want to pay for their health care in the first place and have every incentive to deny uh, supplying care for people. So I don't think that the Affordable Care Act was this great step forward. Um, we still have 30 million people without health insurance in the United States, even after passage of the Affordable Care Act, even with passage of the Affordable Care Act, we still have uh, millions and millions of people uh, uninsured or underinsured. And I think what the Affordable Care Act really did was it made um, being underinsured the norm in the United States. Uh, it basically um, allows for when you have like, I think the new stats are like 50% of the population in the United States or more, it might even be 60%. If they had a bill of uh, it's something like $3,000 or $1,000, they wouldn't be able to pay it. And if you have a bunch of people in the United States or majority of the people in the United States who are underinsured, then even when they go to try to get health care, they still have a health a bill that might completely destroy them economically. And you have a large percentage of people in the United States in our current health care system who get employment or who get health insurance from their employers. So what happens is that actually damages any type of uh, organizing that you can do in the workplace because if you're continually concerned about the fact that you're getting your health insurance through your employer you're going to be way less likely to challenge your employer over any type of oppression that you're undergoing in the workplace because you're going to be afraid of losing your health insurance um, so I think moving towards what um, many of my um, friends in the um, healthcare community call a national improved Medicare for all system. So it's not just many people have a misconception of we're just going to take the current Medicare system and expand it to cover the entire population. It's mm -hmm. not just taking Medicare and expanding it, but it's actually taking Medicare, improving upon Medicare and expanding it to the entire population. So healthcare in the United States is a right, not a privilege, uh, I think could be a huge step forward just for our overall healthcare in the United States. And then uh, also a big step forward, just I think for the working class and organizing um, against the capitalist economic system, which I can talk a little bit more about that. Um, for, for, I'll say, healthcare practitioners inside of the healthcare system, so not just physicians, but also nurse practitioners, PAs, nurses, you name it, I think that we also need to start shifting our focus of how we view health and that how we view what contributes to somebody's health. So at least just in my training specifically, there was a lot of focus on like how the, the dynamics of the body, the dynamics of illness, how certain pathogens work in the body, what medication we're going to give for those pathogens, those types of things. There was much less education around all of the social and institutional factors, which I think are the key drivers of those pathologies, um, whether physical, psychological, you name it. Today in medical education, there's more coverage of what they would call the quote, social determinants of health. I think that's the new kind of catchphrase. But even in medical education, there is a, we'll touch on social determinants of health, almost like, all right, we checked off that box. Mm -hmm. Now we can just go back to memorizing this, that, or the other thing. And I think that that's actually really, it's like an insidious way of, making sure that physicians stay conditioned inside of their roles of the chief profit producers inside of the healthcare system. So we're going to focus on, you can talk about the social determinants of health, but you really need to understand the biology or the, or the, you really need to understand the medicine is what they say. You really need to focus on the medicine. And what they mean by the medicine is you really need to shut up, keep your head down and keep the factory running, whether it's in the hospital or in the clinic. You can't focus on the fact that three people own more money than like half of the US population. You can't focus on the fact that the IPCC says we have like 10 years to avoid climate collapse. You can't focus on the fact that so many people in the United States are, ho are homeless or living on the streets or people are alienated inside of their jobs 
or studies like um, the Whitehall study out of Britain shows that when you have vast levels of inequality, it actually influences health. You can't focus on those things because those things are institutional and might actually challenge structures of power in society. And if physicians, people who society has put in a position of being lauded because they're a doctor and those types of things start to challenge that, that would be somewhat dangerous to the status quo. So you need to just focus on these specific things. Mm -hmm. So I think like to summarize, moving towards Medicare for all system when it comes to reform and then start to really like revolutionize how we're thinking about health and how we practice health and how we work with patients instead of just like viewing patient a, a patient as just somebody quick in front of us that we're going to treat and then get out of our clinic. How we can look at them as like colleagues and allies in the movement, I think are where we need to start moving. That's huge, man. That's huge. And for me, I feel like the incentive structure is upside down. You know, like, like you said, with, with what you're they're kind of trying to steer you to don't worry about all the other stuff, just kind of push the prescription drugs as the medicine and keep it rolling, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's like, that seems backwards to me. That seems like the incentive structure is, I don't want to, maybe corrupt is the right word. Something's, something's fishy there, you know? And, and two, it seems backwards because like, and I said this on, on a previous podcast with Mike Frosky, so, but I'll repeat myself. It's like, Shouldn't my doctor get paid for like keeping me out of the hospital, you know, preventative medicine? And shouldn't that be where our investment goes? And shouldn't we be doing more to address like the chronic health conditions that are affecting half of America? Um, yeah, I mean, I completely you said about health insurance as leverage sort of for your employer is huge, too. I mean, that's I mean, we went to Gov School for Global Entrepreneurship. How can you how can you be an entrepreneur like if you have a family? And you're relying on your health insurance coverage from your employer. Like, how could you be in any position to take any sort of major risk to start a business, to start a company, to, to do anything different other than like staying in your lane and, and doing what you're told? You know, it's like it's it's like rigged. It feels like. Yeah. Um, so a couple of comments on that. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, one, you mentioned the incentive structure being upside down. So I would, I've been um, researching more and more like the origins of the medical system in the United States. And I'm reading a book. I, the only part of the title that I remember is Rockefeller Medicine. And what they talk about in that book is at the, like the origins of our medical system was largely pushed by some of the wealthy oligarchs in our society at the time. So I think like the kind of like end of 19th century or 20th century, Rockefeller, Carnegie, these people who are some of the wealthiest oligarchs in our society are putting more and more money into how the medical system is developing. And at the time, there's a lot of preliminary texts of leaders of these medical societies basically wanting to have, wanting to find ways to make more money, have more control, um, and make sure that there is a specific class content to who has control over the medical system. Mm -hmm. So they, the, the author talks about how, while there are benefits to what he calls the scientific scientification of medicine. So when we started to actually learn about pathogens and what causes many types of illness directly and those types of things, while yeah. that was beneficial to medicine, it also helped to consolidate power inside of the medical system for mm -hmm. certain wealthy, one, certain entities of the wealthy elite to control the system more because you didn't have as many of like these homeopathic doctors. You started to basically like shun the homeopathic doctors. You started to um, shun anybody like who maybe came from a different class content that wanted to get into medical training um, because you had to get into medical training, pay for it, those types of things. Mm -hmm. And at the advent of our system, 
uh, people actually were saying this is a way for us to keep poor people out of the medical system. Um, this is a way for us to make sure that we consolidate that power. Um, so, and then the other thing that they really, really focused on at that time was they focused on identifying these pathogens and treating them and forgetting all of the social that affects health. Mm -hmm. And that was really advantageous for the powerful at that time, especially if you look at like Rockefeller or Carnegie, you name it, because people were starting to question the robber barons and those types of things. They were starting to question the, the class structure of our society. And if you had medical professionals who were just focusing on like these disease entities, whatever this bacteria was, or those types of things, you, they were so focused on that that they were no longer focusing on that social class structure of society and how that might influence health. And I think that that then really even connects to today with what I was talking about with um, what I even hear in my everyday practice and from people in my residency program who are deemed higher than me or the faculty or those types of things, which is you need to focus on the medicine. You just need to focus on the patient in front of you and quote what impact you can make through your medical career. And I think that honestly, that's really, I've reduced that to a form of gaslighting. And what they do is when you try to start to connect the illness and suffering that you're seeing in front of you to these larger structures, mm -hmm. people who have been conditioned to not think that way, which is very advantageous for these systems, and that's why they are in the positions of power that they're in, start to gaslight you. I don't even know if it's intentionally. I think it's just like they've been filtered to do that, so that's just how they act. They start to gaslight right. you and make you second guess the way that you're thinking or the way that you're analyzing things, so then you just fall in line and condition and continue these production mechanisms inside of the medical system. Right. And then the medical, you, so you basically are saying, okay, well, the only thing I can do inside of my role as a healthcare practitioner is somebody comes in with an infection, I can prescribe something to them. Somebody comes in with high blood pressure, or diabetes, I can prescribe medication to them. And that's my role inside of the healthcare system. What your, what that your role also is, is you are acting as a, um, as a, as a factory worker pretty much on the, on like the factory line of medicine. Somebody comes into clinic, I have to be able to, by the time I'm done with residency, see them in 15 minutes, get them on the factory line and get them off the factory line and get them the hell out of there. I think more and more, and this is, I think, to connect to your point about preventative medicine, what I've been trying to do in my practice is find ways to not only, yes, if somebody has diabetes or those types of things, I think we have, or an infection or high blood pressure, we have certain types of, of medications that can be good to help with that, but also identify ways that people can affect their own lives that can maybe benefit, uh, help, uh, treat those illnesses that way, mm -hmm. but also I think connect illness to larger systemic structures. So I don't know if there's a better term that I found for it, but like organizing in the medical visit. So for example, if I have a patient with <coughs> diabetes that comes in to see me, the first thing, maybe not the very first thing that I start talking with them about, but eventually I start now talking about how food companies calculate bliss points. Uh, on their food to, so for people who don't, who aren't familiar with this, uh, food companies like Coca-Cola, if there's a soda that you have, what they've actually found is that the human body likes a particular amount of sugar, salt, and fat. You can, there's a great book called Sugar, Salt, Fat that you can read on this, mm -hmm. uh, that they, if it's too much, the human body doesn't like it. If it's too little, the human body doesn't like it. it the human body and the human brain likes a certain middle level of each of these uh, sugar um, entities. I read and, about, I know, I know what you mean. Yeah, so, so basically they calculate this type of stuff in their labs to make people addicted to their food. So what I tell patients is, listen, this is what happens. These food companies, I literally say to a patient, and this would probably be considered unprofessional, but I say, these food companies don't give a shit about you. They, I've said to a patient with the wife in the room, um, the food company doesn't give a flying fuck if you die tomorrow. They, she cares if you die tomorrow, but this food company doesn't. 
they want you to be addicted to their food and frankly they want you to keep eating it and they if you die great for them you're making money for them so right. i i talk with them about those types of things and what i found is people are one pissed off that they're being completely um basically poisoned and exploited and those types of things and i, I personally think that it's a way to help patients find a connection between their own health and then these oppressive structures in our society and how they can take ownership over that and then potentially think about fighting against that and i think that that's where healthcare practitioners need to start moving towards to start connecting what they're seeing in front of them with a patient with these larger structures and then finding ways to fight and dismantle them. Yeah. And the analogy that I was thinking about when you first started talking about this is like, it's almost like your superiors are asking you to treat, treat the leaves, like just pay attention to the leaves on the tree and like treat the leaves and don't, don't fucking worry yourself about anything else. And like what you're saying is like, yeah, I'll treat the leaves, but like, we're going to talk about the roots too. Well, I have you in the room. We're going to talk about the roots. We're going to talk about what, you know, the system and how it's set up. And like, because otherwise your leaves are just going to get sick again. Like it's not going to solve your ultimate problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. 100%. And it's tricky too. Like back to the duality thing. It's like these companies are poisoning people, but people are also poisoning themselves. It's like a trick. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like the individual feeds into the social and the social feeds into the individual. So like, and I think that's what you're trying to tell these people is like, these companies aren't necessarily going to change. You have to take individual responsibility to like not eat these things. And I know it's hard because they're designed to be super addictive and super pleasurable to eat. But like having diabetes is not pleasurable. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you that, you know, yeah. so trying to get them to connect like the long term consequences with like the short term pleasures that they've been kind of duped into pursuing is yeah. it's difficult. Yeah, or the, I mean, the other example that I use is is uh, what we are taught so often through our training is, all right, somebody comes in, they have a, they say that their mood has been off. You're going to talk with them about how they've been feeling. If they basically are going to screen for like depression, anxiety, those types of things. You're going to make sure that they're not at a, a an acute threat to themselves that they don't want to hurt themselves or anybody else you're going to talk mm -hmm. with them about this type of stuff and while there i think is a little bit more now in medicine talk about whether it can be like talk therapy or meditation or those types of things i think that that's as far as we go on one end of this spectrum and then as far as we go on the other end of the spectrum is uh we're going to give you a medication so these are the limitations of how we're talking about this. And um, I don't know, I would bet that you have uh, um, Chomsky's writings. He talks about the best way to condition a population is to set strict boundaries of debate and allow for vigorous debate inside of those boundaries and then nothing outside of those boundaries. And I think that we do something similar. We do it all throughout our, our every day and all throughout our society, but we'll talk about like this strict microcosm of like mental health inside of medicine. So we do it there too, where those are the two boundaries, meditation, holistic things. The other boundary is, and now I think even medicine is going to start talking about psychedelics and that type of stuff a little bit more because, and I would love to get into that conversation. I think psychedelics are becoming even more commodified to inside of medicine. So now that we're finding ways to potentially commodify them, they are being put on this boundary. And then the other side of the boundary is other medicines basically. But what I also like to talk with patients about is, okay, so what's your everyday life like? And the other, I'll give an example of a patient that I had the other day. She was talking about like her job situation and how her employer, she just feels like does not give a shit about her. And she just has to work like this nine to five or nine to eight sometimes. She's exhausted. She has to get home to her kids. Uh, the employer's threatening her with this, that, or the other thing. She... Um, her income already isn't that much. She's having trouble paying rent. And then, so the connections that I like to make first, a legitimizing that, that, um, suffering that that person is going through right. and saying, you know, anybody else going through that would, would also be suffering like you for the most part. So right. I think that that's a powerful in itself because we're not pathologizing, what it what this peer person is experiencing which i think also often happens oh you're undergoing that you must have some type of abnormality or illness so i can give you a medication or whatever therapy to help treat this 
illness or pathology that you're undergoing when really you're undergoing a natural reaction to what you're experiencing in your right. life. Right. Um, and then the other part of that, I th so I think that that's powerful in itself, but I think the other part of it is to then connect what what that patient is experiencing with some of these structural things. So, oh, you're having trouble paying rent. It's funny because three people own more wealth in our society than half of the people who are living uh, who are living from day to day. So it's right. crazy that somebody like Jeff Bezos owns $150 billion or whatever it is, and you have trouble paying rent. Is that a just society that we're living in? And then also talking about how that workplace control is organized. Like, do you think that saying to a patient, do you think that it's okay that somebody at the top of your institution makes all of the decisions about what to do uh, about what to produce, how to produce, and what to do with the profits. Like, do you think that's okay when you and your coworkers do all of that work, and there are a few people making all of those decisions, and who are determining your hours like that, and who are putting so much strain on your on your everyday life? Does that sound okay to you? And kind of like planting those little seeds for organizing in each visit. Like maybe the next visit, I haven't seen that woman after that, but she, I think that even after that visit, she um, stated how A, heard she failed, B, how empowering it was to think about things that way. But then I think in future visits, conversations can be around well, there are certain unions that that organize workplaces. Have you ever thought about getting together with your coworkers and basically standing up to your boss? Have you thought about those types of things and sort of planting those seeds for organizing and resistance, which are not seen as the uh, the medical uh, practitioners like in the medical practitioner's tool house or what even they should be doing and probably would be seen as quote unprofessional or just like unproductive in a medical visit. But I think that they are essential to, if my idea of a goal of any medical professional or medical practitioner or health practitioner in general, I think that that's a better word, is just to improve somebody's overall well-being. And if that is the goal, then this is completely inside of that that um, that range of what we should be doing. It's right. just that there's often not that education or realization for the healthcare worker to have those types of conversations with the patient in front of them. Right. And as you were describing that, I was kind of thinking about you know, your, your employer and why they would be sort of against you doing some of this. And I think part of it is like, they don't want you to be like pushing your ideology on other people. Right. And if that's what it, all of that it was, I would probably agree with them to some extent, but that's not really what you're doing. You're trying to help these people understand the broader kind of, um, the broader problem and d further define the problem in order to start addressing real solutions. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I guess the, the one other um, response that I would mention to that is, so uh, Zinn has this, I think it was a book that he initially wrote, Howard Zinn, um, Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. And, and he basically, the overall point is things are moving in a particular direction currently. Right. There's consistently propaganda about a specific ideology that is hit against the public over and over and over again through various processes. So I don't think, I think that me doing this actually is combating that propaganda that's already happening. And I think that actually the argument, which I've heard that argument, even in medical school, that argument is made to us about how maybe we shouldn't do that. But by not talking about that, I think we are actually contributing to that propaganda on the other side. So, so we're not actually, it's not like we're just being some neutral healthcare practitioner, just like, oh yeah, these things aren't great, but also there's the other side. No, like things are actively harming people and we are then being complicit in that harm by not saying anything about it. Um, and I think more and more, physicians need to be okay with actually resisting. I think it's just resisting authority in general. Like when I'm in the hot, so we rotate 
uh, as residents, you rotate both in the hospital and in the clinic setting. And often I'm in the hospital and I'm in like the emergency room and patients are just like bed to bed to bed. It's completely disgusting. Um, the care in hospitals in the United States is absolutely horrible. I think it's like one of the most dangerous places for people to be, even though people think like when they have something, I need to get to the hospital, which there can be some benefits there, but they're also completely very, very dangerous. But when I talk with patients in the hospital and people are like, why is the ED like this? I hint to them like the ED is like this because it's beneficial for the hospital. It's beneficial for the people at the top of the hospital. That's why the ED is like this. And unless we as a society start to organize around those things and resist them, they're going to continue the way that they are, which right. is obviously for a number of reasons, extremely detrimental to the well-being of people in society for the most part, while beneficial for a very, very few. And, and when you say the ED is like this, that's the emergency department, I'm guessing? Yeah, the emergency, yeah, the emergency you're, department. You're describing like kind of a state of kind of unclean, uh, overly crowded, kind of overworked people, right? That's kind of what I'm imagining as you're describing that. Yes. And that's exactly right. Like that's, who does that benefit? the owner of the hospital, right? Push as much product as you can through with as low as an expense as possible. That keeps your profits high. That keeps, you know, where if like, you know, if you were, if it was a little more relaxed and there's a little more people, like sure, that's better for your mental health and your st state and you're, you're able to treat patients better on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but you're not as able to treat as many, you mm -hmm. know, you're not as able to crank out as many, you know? So it's like, yeah, clearly that's, that's the incentive structure that they're, that they're kind of working towards. And so how do you, how do you begin to change that? Because something I liked when you were talking about uh, kind of the roots of the problem with your patients is like you define, define the problem, but then also propose a solution or at least like how to start thinking about the solution. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that part of at least what I found as part of that solution is to do that, that organizing in the visit, I guess is what I'll call it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that also part of this is to, I think one of the first things is to like help identify the problem. Um, and I am of the thought process that capitalism and the and that way of organizing an economic system is a key driver to that problem. So just to define that, there's a definition that I like from a physician named uh, Vincent Navarro, and he says that capitalism is a social formation in which a class, the often the capitalist class or bourgeoisie, has hegemonic dominance over the means of production, consumption, and legitimation. Um, and I think that, the, I, I mean, I like that definition of how, how he defines the economic system as a whole. I think that we need to start talking about how that, I mean, study after study, Thomas Piketty, who's a, I think a French economist, wrote an entire book length study on this and studied capitalist economies um, for a couple centuries, I thought, and found that basically his ultimate conclusion of that book was, by organizing the workplace in in a capitalist manner, it concentrates wealth and power to the top. And I think more and more we need to begin talking about that, how that, and then the downstream detrimental effects of that, and then organizing against that. So I've tried to, I mean, just as an individual uh, healthcare practitioner, move outside of the specific realm of healthcare, more to other realms of organizing to challenge capitalist modes of production. So, I mean, it like there are these different movements, Extinction Rebellion, the Sunrise Movement, these different movements of people that have been challenging this. Mm -hmm. I've participated in Extinction Rebellion actions and I think like talking with people more and more about participating in nonviolent direct action and actually like upending um, the gears of production or, or slowing the gears of production. I think that we're moving to a stage in society where we need to be willing to do that um, for overall well-being and at least personally I advocate among other healthcare providers that this is 
not just within the realm of like healthcare, but also what healthcare providers should be doing um, overall. So I think participating in in um, forms of nonviolent direct action like that and organizing along those lines. Um, and then I think in addition to that, just participating in whether it's organizing around other systems. So I'm part of a, an international collective of um, activists and publications called Left Voice. Um, I think they're in like 12 countries around the world. I saw that video um, posted from that group the other day. Yeah, so they so they make various um, educational materials and write various um, article like articles and that analyzing um, the current economic system and their international contingent is uh, key in some of the organizing that's going on in Chile right now in Bolivia right now uh, like all over the world so I think that partic finding um, ways to or groups that are already challenging the capitalist system and then plugging into those and finding ways that you can participate in those are really useful and that's what I've personally been trying to do. Um, so it's like I look for things both on an individual what level like in my everyday practice and those types of things and then how to become parts of larger movements because I think uh, movements are going to be what really help to change these systems that we see harming people. Hmm. Well, let's back up to when you kind of self-identified as a revolutionary Marxist. Tell me more about that. Like, what does that really mean to you? How did you kind of arrive at that self-identification? How does, how do you, you know, what kind, uh, let's just start there for now. Yeah. So, I mean, I think overall what comes with identifying like in, on, in that vein is understanding that pretty much like a and i guess the, the next question is going to be like what do you define as a revolution and i think people define that in different ways honestly but mm -hmm. really like that a that a revolution of the current capitalist means of production will be necessary to achieve the type of society that we all want to achieve, which is a more equal, just society that gives people meaning and that sustains life forces on our planet besides human life forces. So I, that's how I define that, that phrase as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, I think that then what comes with that is really like you need to identify what is a capitalist system that we are trying to revolutionize, which is what I tried to define earlier with that quote from Dr. DeMaro, Navarro. But I think also you can like you can view it in a nutshell. There's this there's this economist that I really like, Rick Wolf, who um, he's a economist out of I think he's he's trained at like Yale Harvard and then he's a tenured professor I think at Massachusetts Amherst but I think he's at the new school right now uh, in New York City and he kind of defines uh, capitalism as a system where a um, a small group of of wealthy people determine what to produce how to produce and what to do with the profit so you basically a capitalist entity or business is basically a large business where there's a board of directors so like CEO, COO, those types of things, and then wealthy shareholders who determine everything in the direction of how that, uh, how that entity runs. So in the United States, I think it's something like the top one or three percent own something like 60 or 70 percent of all stocks. So when we talk about the wealthy shareholders, it's not like everyday person who has some stock in Google. It's still a few rich people who own a majority of the stocks in these publicly traded companies. And what ends up coming with that is if you have a company, let's say it's like GM has a factory in, I don't, uh, Detroit, and they basically say, you know, it'd be more profitable for us to just move somewhere else, then they just do that. 
and they have no responsibility to the workers or taxpayers that help to build that entity in Detroit. They can just move wherever they want because it's more profitable for them. We see the same thing when it comes to um, polluting wherever things like BP in Ecuador, they're in Ecuador, they have no responsibility to the citizens of Ecuador where they're working, so they can just pollute the environment completely, destroy the environment, because it lowers the cost of production and increases their profit or benefits their bottom line. But what that does is, is it's hugely detrimental to health. So I think that that way of organizing enterprises is inherently exploitative and destructive for a multitude of reasons that I just highlighted. And that's what I would call a capitalist way of organizing enterprises. So what a revolutionary Marxist thinks is that we need to change that way of organizing enterprises and, and completely revolutionize the way that we organize society if we want to achieve the uh, those things that people really value in their lives that I mentioned before. And I think a, a really powerful way to do stuff like that is to start locally with worker cooperatives and organizing worker cooperatives and, and stronger unions and really taking, you know, uh, strength in numbers and setting up structures that give people ownership, you know, or at least give yeah. them the opportunity to have ownership rather than just being sort of the, a pawn in a larger game where they don't have much control or say over anything and they just kind of ordered to execute the plan. I, I a million percent agree with that. I think um, I mentioned the Whitehall studies before, and the Whitehall studies were studies done, I forget what year, but basically in they were done in Britain and in um, they looked at like public sector workers in Britain, so like government-funded workers in Britain, and they – uh, they were originally, it was a way that they were just trying to look at like blood pressure and diabetes and those types of things and find like if they could benefit the health of the, of the public sector workers. And th it just happened that they were able to do a really interesting study on it because of the way that the income of the workers were set up. They, it was basically like set up in tiers, how people had their income. Mm -hmm. um, so they studied people's income in these tiers and basically, when they asked people about those tiers, they found in like a higher tier because of their income and their position of power in the public sector. They had more control over their lives and they felt like they had more control both in the workplace and outside of the workplace. And they found that as you went down those tiers in a stepwise fashion, people had more risk for a high blood pressure, heart attack, coronary artery disease, those types of things. And one of the main, they looked at like, well, maybe people who are at the bottom tiers are smoking more, or maybe they're doing poor health practices more, and maybe that's contributing to it. And they actually then standardized for those types of things. So they right. took that all out of the study, and they found that it was people's perceived control over their lives that most affected their health. So when I go back to uh, to go back to what I was saying before about this organizing to do as a healthcare worker to talk with patients about these types of things, I think these things are what actually contribute to better health outcomes for people. And you see these worker co-ops, um, whether it's in you, there's many in the United States. A lot of people don't even realize there are so many in the United States. And then. There's their work costs like the, the one of the biggest ones is um, Mondragon uh, in the Basque region of Spain. And Mondragon is like a collection of worker co-ops, basically. And one of the interesting things that I think happened there was during the economic crash where Wall Street basically destroyed our economy and then we decided to just bail them out. Um, mm -hmm. They Mondragon was one of the few companies at that time that was still doing pretty well. And the reason why they were able to do well is because there was they all of the workers in a worker co-op decide what to do, what to produce, how to produce, and what to do with the profits. And they all vote collectively. And you can't have those like 300 to 1 
distinctions of income between the top person and the bottom person. There are rules put in place there. So when everybody, when uh, you know the demand for the goods that the that these co-ops were producing went down, they all voted, well, we'll work a day less so more people can keep their jobs. So it wasn't just that people were fired. Right. People were able to to actually be more dynamic in their job and it allowed the institution to then survive. And then you see because these institutions are much more dynamic and I think much better for society on multitude of levels in Italy, they have this thing called the Marcora law now where if a company or if a person is going to declare bankruptcy, you have a choice whether you want public uh, like um, social funding basically like we would have for welfare or that type of stuff or if you want money from the government to actually start a worker co-op because they found that worker co-ops are so successful for their society for a multitude of reasons. So I agree with you like that's the direction that I think that we need to be moving. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to the point you made about when they in this study they found a way to kind of normalize for some other things that might be impacting your health. And they found that it was like um, this perception of control of their lives. I think that's like speaks to sort of an ancient thing in, in people and really animals altogether. It's like the mental state of a prey animal versus a predator. You know, if you're, if you don't feel like you have control over your situation, you're a prey animal and you're in prey mode maybe all day. And like, that's going to impact your health. You're like on guard all the time. Your territory is all ramped up. You know, everything's like uh, dialed all the way up because you're in a constant state of fear, you know, where if you can, you feel like you have control, it's like, okay, well now I'm, now I'm the, pre now I'm the predator, right? And now I'm in control. Now I make the decision. And it's like, it, sh it changes your whole perspective on everything, you know? So I think that's huge. No, that's a really then, good point. And then the other thing you brought up is, or, or, or just kind of bringing it back to like, capitalism versus socialism and again i think for me it's like the duality i see capitalism as like production and i see socialism as like distribution and like we need both like we still need to be producing goods and producing value and 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 you know using resources to you know make our lives better but we also need to be distributing those in a way that's like fair you know and it's not one or the other. Like it's, we need to bring balance with these two forces. They're not necessarily competing. They need to, we need to find a way to bring them in harmony, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that if you define capitalism that way, then I think that, yeah, you need to bring harm, find a way to bring harmony into the, the economy or productions and distribution sectors of the economy. I think that, Unfortunately, the way that the production se sector of the economy is currently, um, and I think that this goes back to like the revolutionary Marxism mm -hmm. part of this, the way that we have um, organized that production s sector of the economy, which I would define as the capitalist sector of the economy, because it inherently concentrates wealth the way that it does and then concentrates power the way that it does unfortunately i don't think that there is a way to reconcile that the dynamics of that system that are inherent to it because what you see is you see that that system continually needs to produce profit and even when certain controls are attempted to put on it because of its inherent dynamics, then it reverses those controls. It, so whenever we try to uh, like just put a, whether it's on like BP, Shell, you name it, we're just gonna put a couple regulations here, there, and try to get you to just like, not just like, don't be assholes. We're not gonna completely destroy your entire company, but all we're just asking is just try not to be assholes. It's kind of like, the executive's like, I just can't not be an asshole. I just got to do it. And then, and then it like, you see the reform reversed and you see what we're, what we're getting at now, which is like Australia, a billion animals dying in Australia from fires. And while that's happening, the Australian government and the Australian coal companies 
the Australian government is still giving subsidies to the coal companies because they're saying that they need it. And the coal companies are still drilling for coal. And it's like, we literally, I don't know if you can have a more, it's right in front of you. And still, it's just like, we need to drill for coal. Or the oil companies in the United States, we had the IPCC report come out or like this new report, which I think is uh, Der Spiegel reported on it um, on the in earlier December and came out of the UN and they argue that at this point, like 1.5 degrees limitation is out of the realm of reality, which then I was uh, reading some other scientists from NASA and things who are saying like, I think that they're basically arguing that's a little extreme and the data is a little flawed in that study. But while these studies are coming out, even if it's impossible to reach 1.5 degrees nor here nor there, the IPC study, IPCC study is still there. While these studies are coming out, oil companies are saying we need to, we have all this oil in reserve that we've already drilled. We still need to sell it and burn it. Like that's the direction that I, th I think that the economy continually goes to. And I don't know if in that frame it's reconcilable from that perspective. Now, I think if you define it as production of goods and distribution of goods, then I think that those two things can be reconcilable. And I think that they can be reconcilable inside of a worker co-op system because you have workers who aren't going to, who if in Australia, their houses are burning up, they are probably going to be like, okay, wait a second, we might need to stop with this. Mm -hmm. um, so from that perspective, then yeah, I guess it's reconcilable. So I guess it depends on like how you define the, um, the terms. Mm -hmm. Oh man, it's a pretty gigantic mess, you know? And I yeah. think part of the root of the problem is people are too good at discounting the future. You know, it's like, well, my, or they're in such a state of like needing to meet their immediate needs that they can't really even think like midterm, let alone long term, you know? Yeah. And it kind of puts us in a, a trap of just further creating these problems that are going to ultimately lead to our demise, you know, where if, if we kind of had a, if we took a longer time horizon as our, like our lens of decision-making probably be a lot better off in the long term, but it would cost a lot more in the short term, but that's worth it, you know? Yeah. I, I, and the other, I mean, to, to comment on that, I completely agree with what you're saying about people being in this state of having to meet their immediate needs. I think that that's part of the reason why we it's we've we have so many people who are living in poverty. It's very advantageous to continually have people living on the on like the edge of homelessness basically right. because when you're consistently living on the edge of homelessness then you are basically worried about that and you're not worried about what else is going on outside of that. And I think that that goes back to the beginning of our conversation where or towards the beginning of our conversation where you're we talking about like different reforms and those types of things. And I think that that's where reforms can be beneficial in a way and also helps me to identify what reforms to put energy towards. So like in that video with Left Voice where uh, I talk about the healthcare system and those types of things, at the end I say that achieving Medicare for all won't solve everything, but it'll be a huge step forward for the working class. And what I mean by that is by having it so people are not worried about how they're going to have to get their health care and not worried about if their employer is going to cut their health care, not worried about if they tell their boss to go fuck themselves, if they're not going to, if their sick kid is going to be able to go see a doctor or not, then all of a sudden you create an environment where an individual or a group of individuals might be more willing to start thinking about these other things that are also affecting their lives or if you have like just a basic need met with like an uh and i think that there's i have some problems with this but like a universal basic income or or something where you just help people meet their very very basic human needs like mm -hmm. or if education is just seen as a right and you no longer have like student loan debt and all of these things holding people 
hostage, mm-hmm. then people might be more willing to think about these other things. That's why, I mean, I personally have made a decision to resist paying my student loan debt because I think when we live in an environment where the Pentagon can't account for $21 trillion since 1985, they have, they've admitted that they can't account for $21 trillion. And when we just, when we just approved a, the largest defense spending bill, or I'm not even gonna call it defense because it's not defense, Pentagon right. spending right. bill yeah. in history. And then you're telling me that there's not enough money to pay for people's student loans or to pay for people's medical debt. I'm sorry, but that's horseshit. And we need to, and when we give away so many government subsidies and Amazon isn't even paying taxes and all these things, and then you're going to go tell the public like, hey, hey, make sure you pay your student loan debt. It's like, you know what? Fuck you. I'm not going to pay my student loan debt and you can threaten my credit. You can do whatever you want. But like at some point we got to say enough is enough. And I'm in a position of, I think, privilege that many people aren't to be able to necessarily say that and survive. And in some states, if you say that, you can be thrown in jail. New York is a state Uh where you can't be thrown in jail. But like, I think that we need to start thinking as a society of ways to just be like, we're done with this shit. We're done playing the game and we're done being oppressed. Wow. That's huge, man. That's, that's a ballsy move. I got to tip my cap to you there. That's like, that's, that's a move. You know, uh, we'll see what happens with the move. I might, <laughs> might regret, might regret it. But, uh, but I think, and the other, the only other thing that I think is really important is like it, it is, um, uh, somewhat discouraging when we see this current state of affairs. And I think that there are a lot of studies on this besides the one that I'm going to cite because th- this is the one that's just in my mind. I think there's a great website for this. Uh, it's called popularresistance.com. Um, some friends of mine who are like lifelong activists run the site and they actually have a po- something called a popular resistance school for organizing. And they actually just have like classes, video classes on how social change occurs, what we need to do to create a revolution and those types of things. And one of the things, one of the many studies they cite, one of their first classes is um, the Erica Chenowitz study where they studied um, dictatorships for the past, oh, I don't even know how many years. And they found that they were trying to figure out like what led to overthrow of those dictatorships. And they found that when 3.5% of the population, at least 3.5% of the population was all on board and all resisting the dictatorship, that system was overthrown. Mm -hmm. And I think that that can be really encouraging for people who are like, well, look at this. Jeff Bezos has this much money. These people have so much power. There's the uh, ND National Defense Authorization Act now lets like military weapons go to police domestic police forces and they're like sh- militaries in our streets what are we supposed to do about this but I think like we see movements to resist police brutality to resist um, ecological destruction all these types of things happening and I think we need to build those movements 3.5 percent is like the critical mass number maybe you know like enough people and I don't know if, how close this number is but when I first started this movement the number that I kind of picked at a somewhat thin air is 10 million people, which that's pretty close to three and a half percent of the American pop. Pretty close. It's in that range yeah. anyway, you know, exactly. Be, that'd be, that's a, that's a significant number, you know? Yeah. Like if you had 10 million, like if you think about it, if you had 10 million people on the streets, even if you look at the peak of the anti-war movement, uh, whether it's like, a the war against Vietnam or when we were illegally going into Iraq and Afghanistan, I don't think we had near that many people. Mm-hmm. And, and if we had imagine if we had that many people, I mean, if you look at, I don't know what the percentage of the population in, in Chile is on the street right now, or like in France with the, with the strikes that are going on. I don't know what those exact percentages are, but they're not to that percent of the population. I'm pretty sure. And already the government in Chile was like, all right, we'll rewrite the constitution if you want. Tell us how you, they're still, we will rewrite the constitution. You won't, but that's the rhetoric that they're pushing people to. And we don't see, in the United States, we don't see any put, we're not pushing people to that rhetoric because I don't think that we are, we are as mobilized and coordinated as in other, in other uh, countries. Well, I'm looking forward to being part of that mobilization and, coordination effort and i'm definitely going to 
look into popularresistance.com and see what they have going on and maybe connect with them and get them on the podcast or do some work with them. So I'm definitely going to try to move a little bit of that forward. I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, but if you have time for kind of one more question, I'll give you one more. Sure. What do you think of, what do you think about the current democratic candidates, uh, for president? Okay. Uh, so who do you like? Who don't you like? I mean, I know you kind of probably look at things from a little bit of a conspiracy lens like I do. Um, yeah. What I, do you think about those, of those people? I don't love anyone per se. I think that the Democratic – I'm going to first hate on the whole Democratic Party and then I'll answer your actual question. Yeah, I think that the well, whole – Somebody else that you like better than any of those people or, you know, yeah. it's open-ended, whatever you want to – yeah, I mean, I think that the whole Democratic Party is a party where movements go to die. It's a party for the elite. It's their two, the Democratic and Republican Party are two heads of the same corporate class. The Democratic Party just is there, I think, to give us the illusion that it cares about people a little bit more, but Democrats. Uh, continually are part of oppressing and part of an integral to oppressing the working class. When we look at wars that have been waged, illegal wars that have been waged, when we look at powers that have been given to the presidency, like the, the recent, there's this big thing about the recent drone strike in Iran. The Obama created the drone campaign. Obama had a kill list. Obama, when we look at deportation, Obama deported more people than any other president. When we look at Obama bailed out Wall Street, we like we don't talk about any of those things. Um, Nancy Pelosi is key to keeping us with uh, from getting Medicare for all. She is like one of the biggest enemies of of achieving Medicare for all. Now I. I agree that like the Republican Party is also atrocious, horrible. Donald Trump is a, I, I mean, all of the words that I could, will be running for an hour of all the words that I could describe him, but he's a complete shithead. Like he's a piece of shit. Okay. So I think that, I think that both parties are, are pretty horrible. I think that we need to build something else for the working class outside of that corporate duopoly. And I think that even like movements with the DSA, they're funneling people on some front into the Democratic Party and into that legitimizing that structure, which is problematic. And often I don't think that they even – they obviously support Bernie Sanders. I don't think that they push Bernie Sanders enough, near enough. Um, what if they were telling – like pushing Bernie Sanders – to push people or Bernie Sanders was pushing people to like be out in the streets, disrupting business as usual, those types of things. That would be a whole different ball game or Bernie Sanders. I, I, now I'm transitioning to which candidate, if I had to pick a candidate inside of the democratic party, I think Bernie Sanders is probably a better candidate than most. I think Elizabeth Warren, who I think a lot of like people who identify themselves leaning more left to uh, whatever spectrum on that side you want to say, are probably thinking Bernie and Elizabeth Warren. I think Elizabeth Warren is, uh, I think she's fake. She's a liar. I think that she she produced racist cookbooks in the past. She, she initially um, wasn't really big on Medicare for all. Then all of a sudden is supporting Medicare for all. Now her new Medicare for all bill she's saying isn't going to be for, she's not even going to talk about Medicare for all until four years into her presidency with the new uh, outlines that she's given. If you notice during the last debate, she didn't even really mention Medicare for all much because she's kind of backtracking from it because all the other candidates are pulling her more right. She's voted for war bill after war bill after war bill. Uh, Bernie Sanders also has voted for war bills in the past, but fewer than Elizabeth Warren has. I think it's very peculiar, this whole like a woman can't be president thing that Elizabeth Warren just came out with right after but numbers show that Bernie Sanders has been surging in the polls. And even though uh, Bernie Sanders literally was the one trying to get Elizabeth Warren to run in the past and all this type of stuff, I just think it's like completely ridiculous. So I think like the best candidate out of the the Democratic field is Bernie Sanders. Um, 
I think that that's pretty clear. But I think so. Noam Chomsky had this saying where he's like, voting you each every uh, every election, you just basically hold your nose and vote for somebody. But the real work comes building comes with building something outside of these structures. And mm -hmm. I think that that's where we need to be doing the real work. I think like we get too caught up in this electoral process and especially in the United States, it goes on like forever and ever and ever. And even if you look, even the most progressive candidates that we have, one are, if they get to the point where Bernie is, he was screwed last election out of actually being the front runner. And they've been trying to do that again with him yep. this year. CNN's continual hit pieces on him, or even the last the last debate was a, just a hit piece in itself. Um, so it's clear that the corporate elite, because the media is controlled by like four or six companies, 90% of all media we see is controlled by very few people now, do not want him to be elected. But even if he is elected, I think that we can't be disillusioned by, which I think sometimes the DSA falls into, oh, he's like this messiah that's just going to solve all of these problems. Even when Bernie Sanders was talking about like uh, spending and, uh, and Medicare for all during the last debate, he didn't actually go against the military industrial complex. It was just like, who could be the best <clears throat> the best imperialist president was one of the first questions that they asked. And everybody was right. like, I'll be a little bit better of an imperial president than they will. I don't agree with these wars, but I'll still keep dropping drones and keep our bases and all those types of things. We need to realize that like, we need a working class party with a, I don't even, with a, I guess we can have a, like a, a candidate, but really it's like making collective decisions inside of that working class party, like these worker co-ops, who basically says like, we have a military industrial complex that basically serves to make the world safe for, ex for uh, companies to exploit countries' resources. Right. And we are an empire. The United States is an empire. And unless we dismantle that, we are going to see because the U.S. military is one of the number one institutional, if not, I think it is the number one institutional contributor to climate change. Unless we have a candidate which actually says we need to dismantle the U.S. empire, then we're not gonna we're not gonna get what we really need. And I don't even think Bernie Sanders is doing that. And I don't I think that if we don't recognize that, then we can't push him to do that, right. which I don't see happening right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I watched the debate the other night too, and I agree. It was pretty much a hit piece on him from the beginning. And the way that they, the questions that they asked and the order in which they asked them really shows, tips their hand to me that, yes, who's going to be the best, who, who's going to continue the war? Who's going to, you know, who's going to make sure we're safe? And it's all like using the guise of safety uh, to get the support of the American people. But it's like, it's such a trap. Again, it's like they're setting, they're laying a trap for us and we're falling right into it, you know? How can, how can you afford Medicare for all? How are you going to pay for that, Bernie? Why don't you, commentator, shut the hell up and ask, how can we afford the continual invasion of country after country after country? How can we afford blowing up generals illegally of other countries? How can we afford the continual destruction of countries all over the world that the U.S. empire continues to perpetuate? How can we afford that? That right. question is never asked. Because the same companies that controlled CNN also benefit off of the continued war and destruction. So, so their um, self-righteous commentators there who think they're doing such a great job grilling Bernie are so blind to the fact that they're just supporting that, continue, that machine. Right. So that question is never asked in these debates. <sighs> yeah. And I, I watched it with a really open mind the other day. Like I was really trying to see who here do I like, who here don't I like. And it was kind of hard to tell just by like listening to what they say because, first of all, you don't have a whole lot of time to get into everything. But what was clear was the media was against Bernie. And that's almost good enough reason in and of itself to be for Bernie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, barring everything, set everything else aside, everything else being equal, let's say, that's good enough reason. 
to one. Yeah, because it, yeah, it was clear that there were they were driving hard, hard against him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if they if they screw him out of it like they did last time, and they run somebody, and Trump ends up winning again, they, they almost deserve it for being for being so greedy, you know. And I think, and I think there we need to. I mean, it should have happened during the last election. During the last election, there's all this talk. I have, I have colleagues who are just like, Bernie Sanders is the reason Hillary lost. It's like, are you kidding me? Bernie Sanders is the reason Hillary lost. Hillary was a shitty candidate that ran a shitty campaign that the that the Democratic elite elected because they wanted a shitty candidate that benefited them. They are the ones who got Trump elected. That is why Trump is elected. And all of the policies prior to that that were under Democratic administrations that destroyed the working class in America, that made people pissed off, and basically created the environment for Trump to be elected. This journalist Lee Camp says that Trump is what, the, what this system vomits up near its end. And that's what happened. But the liberal elite can never grapple with that. So instead, they have to say, Bernie's the reason Hillary lost. And they're on track to repeat the same exact shit that happened last time, even with Trump destroying the globe, because they would rather, I would argue that the liberal elite would rather see Trump be elected again than have Bernie Sanders elected. That's how shitty they are. I agree. That's how, that's, that's how it appears anyway. That's really like what it looks like to me. And that's yeah. a really scary thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, any questions for me before we wrap this up? I don't think right now, my friend. This was great. Thank you for having me. It was fantastic talking with you. It's always good to see a friendly face and talk to somebody who knows what they're doing. And this podcast has been a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to keeping it rolling, man. Yeah, anything I can do to help, let me know. Excellent. I appreciate you, young sir. Thank you. Same to you. Take care of yourself and keep in touch, all right? Thanks, for sure. Peace.